Now you might say, well, come on, right? we love our standard model, why are we going to augment it with this extra junk? Uh, just as an aside, you know, there is some motivation for thinking about sectors that only interact with us gravitationally. Uh, after all, there's experimental evidence for dark matter. Uh, uh, dark matter, five times more abundant than ordinary matter, and we only know about it because of its gravitational interactions. And so it's possible, though a little bit depressing, to think that maybe dark matter is just some completely decoupled sector that the only way we're going to find out about it gravitationally. I hope that's not the case. I hope the LHC discovers dark matter in addition to the Sakurai 6 boson. Uh, but this is at least a plausibility. Okay, so I've given you two ways of expanding space-time symmetry, one by supersymmetry, one by decoupling, using the time-honored method of the missing box, uh, which I learned from Sidney Coleman when I took a field theory class at Harvard. Uh, well, you give two things, do them at the same time. Uh, so I've taught you, or told you that you can uh, enhance space-time symmetry with supersymmetry, you can enhance space-time symmetry by decoupling, do them both at the same time. Perhaps the symmetry structure of our universe corresponds to decoupled supersymmetries. And you might say, okay, why should I be interested in decoupled supersymmetries? Um, what makes this interesting phenomenologically is that we know that we have to break our supersymmetry. Our muon and smuon, they can't have the same mass. That implies the existence of one Goldstein. Well, but what about them in their own hidden sector? Do they have to break supersymmetry? And would we know about it? So if they were to break supersymmetry, then there would be a corresponding multiplicity of Goldsteini, multiple fields corresponding to the breaking of supersymmetry. But because gravity, in particular supergravity, couples everything together, it's possible that these multiple Goldsteini, we might actually be able to see both of these degrees of freedom at the LHC. And that's what I want to explore today. So the picture you should have in your mind, here's us. We have our Jeffrey Goldstone, our Goldsteino. And over there in some parallel universe, in this case the parallel universe is my new friend on Facebook, Jeffrey Goldstone, they have their own Goldstein. We have in some sense a doubly superconducting supergravity. How would we know that this is what was going on? What test would we have? So before I launch into this, let me first tell you about some of the uh, properties of a theory that has two Goldstein. And to do that, and tell you about this curious factor of two, I have to remind you of this Beck mechanism or the Sakurai sex mechanism. Okay, so we've discussed this a number of times. Let me just say the words one more time. Uh, what's remarkable and what we're celebrating today is the fact that if you have a spontaneously broken symmetry, but that symmetry corresponds to a gauge symmetry, then the would-be Nambu Goldstone boson from that breaking gets eaten by the gauge boson, giving that gauge boson mass. And a mnemonic that helps you, or at least me, remember it, um, I can imagine uh, Jerry dining on Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> have this mechanism at work. That's the zombie version. <laughs> uh, when you have this mechanism at work, the gauge boson gets a mass proportional to the gauge coupling times the vacuum expectation value of whatever order parameter is breaking that symmetry. And in addition, fermions can get mass from the exact same vacuum expectation value. What happens in supergravity is just a supersymmetric version of this Sakurai 6 mechanism. That is, the Goldstein, this Gold's <coughs> on fermion coming from the spontaneous breaking of supersymmetry is eaten by the gravitino, the spin three halves partner of the graviton. And now you just have to map one thing to the other. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a, an image to, to go here. Um, but the gravitino gets a mass proportional to the effective gauge coupling of gravity, which is uh, one over the Planck scale, times the order parameter for supersymmetry breaking, which we usually call F or D, this in case I'm thinking about F term breaking. And similarly for the superpartners, uh, they also get a mass from this exact same mechanism. So if I break supersymmetry only once, then this uh, Susie Sakurai 6 mechanism is at work. And if you want to know what the spectrum you might expect to see of the LHC is, well, here it is. Here are the fields that we're celebrating today. Uh, the, the W and Z bosons that get their mass from spontaneous symmetry breaking, spontaneous electric symmetry breaking, the top quark, which gets its mass from spontaneous symmetry breaking, and the Sakurai 6 boson that perhaps gets its mass from itself. If supersymmetry is realized in nature, then there'll be supersymmetric partner particles for all the standard model degrees of freedom. They're going to get a mass from spontaneous supersymmetry breaking. And the effective quote-unquote gauge boson for supersymmetry, the gravitino, it will also get a mass, and these masses are correlated in, in some way. So this is what supersymmetry looks like uh, before you thought about, well, wait a second, maybe there's hidden sectors in nature. Maybe I could break supersymmetry multiple times. Maybe I have not just one Gravitino that's eaten by, one Goldstino that's eaten by the Gravitino. Maybe I have multiple Goldstini. Where would they appear on this picture, on this spectrum? And the remarkable result 
is they appear at exactly, to leading order, twice the gravitino mass. If I do this in the supersymmetry multiple times, then the would be eaten modes, but they can't be eaten. You, you're a graviton, uh, gravitino, you can only eat one goldstino. The extra goldstini lying around have a mass exactly twice this. Now, the existence of this state by itself should not be a surprise, and as I'll explain in the next slide, the fact that it's exactly a factor of two heavier should be a surprise. But the existence of this state actually occurs, the same phenomena occurs already in the standard model. Uh, that is, in the standard model, electroweak symmetry is actually broken twice. We don't usually think about it this way. We usually think about having the Sakurai 6 sector uh, giving mass to the longitudinal W, or be forming, when this uh, symmetry breaks, uh, we get goldstone modes that are eaten to form the longitudinal modes of the W and Z boson. We forget, though, that actually, if this sector didn't exist at all, then QCD, chiral symmetry breaking in QCD, would do a perfectly fine job of breaking electric symmetry for you. That is, uh, uh, well, the, the, the basis of theories that we call technicolor theories are saying, oh, the observation that QCD would give a mass to W and Z bosons, we scale that up as one possible uh, explanation for what this sector might be. But QCD by itself would break electric symmetry, <coughs> only it does a really crappy job of it. Uh, the effective vacuum expectation value uh, for the Sakurai 6 boson is 246 GeV, where that effective vacuum expectation value in the case of QCD is more like 130 MeV. But the phenomenological implication of breaking electric symmetry twice is, well, you get two modes. You get both the massive gauge bosons, but also light degrees of freedom that we call pions. So if you break a symmetry multiple times, you get extra light states. That's not a surprise. But the surprise is, in this gauge theory example, the pions are much, much lighter than the WZ boson. In this supersymmetric example with us and them, let's say they are much better at breaking supersymmetry than we are. Their Goldstino gets eaten to form the longitudinal components of the Gravitino. Our Goldstino uh, remains in the spectrum, uh, but its mass is twice the mass of the other sector. So whereas in the standard model, the would-be Goldstone modes are lighter than the gauge boson, here, the Woodsby Goldstino modes are heavier by a factor of two. Now, this factor of two is, well, insane <laughs> at first glance. And uh, uh, Yasunori Cliff and I spent hours and hours debating whether the <coughs> factor of two was, was real. Uh, in fact, it's, it's not just a factor of two. If you, if you break supersymmetry 50 times, 50 separate hidden sectors, hidden uh, uh, universes out there, they all want to break supersymmetry. One linear combination of the Goldstinos gets eaten to form the Gravitino, and you have 49 Goldstini all degenerate with a mass 2 at leading order. Right. Where is this factor of 2 coming from? Well, this is a deep result in supergravity. Uh, uh, you can ask me more about it offline. For the aficionados in the audience, this factor of 2 is related to the fact that the order parameter for supersymmetry breaking, these F terms, has mass dimension 2. That 2 is precisely this 2 here. And so when I say that uh, uh, fields, that these things are degenerate with two up to corrections, for example, if fx gets an anomalous dimension, then the mass actually becomes two plus that, that appropriate anomalous dimension. Okay, so I'm not going to explain this factor of two. Instead, I'm going to tell you how you would go to a collider and find, verify that this factor of two is realized in nature. So the, <coughs> the, the picture you should have in mind, two sectors bro both breaking supersymmetry, and we want to find some observable such that we can see two peaks. One peak corresponding to their Goldstino, somehow an experimental measure that would verify that their Goldstino exists and has a mass of M3 halves. And a measure